Farewell to Manzanar, Chapter 6. Whatever he did had flourish. That cane Papa Pop brought back with him, he had carved and polished himself in North Dakota. When his limp went away, he continued to use it. He didn't need to. He liked it as a kind of swagger stick, such as a military officer sometimes use. When he was angry, he would wield it like the flat of a sword, whacking out at his kids or his wife or his hallucinations. He kept that cane for years and it served him well. I see it now as a sad homemade version of the samurai sword his great great grandfather carried in the land around Hiroshima at a time when such warriors weren't much needed anymore, when their swords were both their virtue and their burden. It helps me understand how Papa's life could end at a place like Manzanar. He didn't die there, but things finished for him there. Whereas for me, it was like a birthplace. The camp was where our lifelines intersected. He was the oldest son in a family that had for centuries been of the samurai class. He used to brag that they had owned more land than you could cross on horseback in a single day. By the time he was born in 1887, they weren't warriors any longer. Japan was in the throes of that rapid, confusing metamorphosis from a feudal to an industrial nation, which began when Commodore Perry's Black Hold Armada steamed into Tokyo Bay and forced the Japanese to open their ports and cities to Western trade. Papa's grandfather was a judge, at one point a magistrate for the small, lovely island of Miyajima. He had four children, including one son, Papa's father. His three daughters were among the first women in Japan to receive university degrees. One daughter married an army general, who for a time governed Formosa. And it was this uncle general who encouraged Papa to enroll in a military school. As far as everyone could see, he was preparing for a career in the Navy. Then at 17, he abruptly dropped out. His favorite aunt lent him some money. And a short time later, he bought passage on a ship bound for the Hawaiian Islands. That was the last anyone in Japan saw or heard of him. In those days, it was a headstrong idealist. He was spoiled the way eldest sons usually are in Japan, used to having his way, and he did not like what he saw happening to the family. Ironically, it foreshadowed just the sort of thing he himself would be faced with later on. Too many children and not enough money. His father's first wife bore five children. When she died, he remarried and four more came along. His father, who had been a public official, ended up running a tea house in Hiroshima, something like a cabaret. It was a living, but Papa wanted no part of this. In the traditional Japanese class system, samurai ranked just below nobility. Then came farmers and those who worked the land. Merchants ranked fourth, below the farmers. For Papa, at 17, it made no difference that times were hard. The idea of a tea house was an insult to the family name. What's more, their finances were in such a state that even as an eldest son, there was almost nothing for him to look forward to. The entire area around Hiroshima, mainly devoted to agriculture, was suffering a severe depression. In 1886, Japan had for the first time allowed its citizens to immigrate and thousands from his district had already left the country in search of better opportunities. Papa followed them. He reached Honolulu in 1904 with a letter of introduction to a cousin who taught school on Oahu. Papa used to tell the story of his first stroll through town, just off the boat and wanting to stretch his legs before looking up his relatives. He came across a sign outside a building that said in three languages, workers wanted. Proud that he could read the English as well as the Japanese, he figured he'd have an edge over anyone else applying. He was feeling cocky anyway on this first day in the new world, 17 years old and a little money burning in his pocket. He stepped into a men's shop a few doors down and bought himself a new suit, a new shirt, a new tie, and a new hat, everything he'd seen the most prosperous men along the street wearing. He changed clothes in the store and then went to see about that job. He followed arrows from the sign to the back of the building where he found a yard full of half-dressed Chinese and Japanese field hands waiting in line to apply to work in the sugarcane. His disdain for them was met with laughter. They looked at him as if he were a maniac, pointing with derision at his dandy's outfit. He rushed back to the street, cursing, dismayed, 
humiliated, heading for the safety of his cousins. A few weeks later, he was introduced to a vacationing American, a lawyer from Idaho who offered to pay his passions to the States and provide room and board in exchange for three years work as a houseboy. Papa accepted. It looked better than sweating in the fields, which was how most of his countrymen were making their new start. And one imagines that the American mainland glittered for him the way it did for all those entrepreneurs and pilgrims and runaways and adventurers who crossed the Atlantic and the Pacific, hoping to carve out a piece of it for themselves. In Idaho, he worked as a valet, a cook, a chauffeur, a mechanic, a general handyman. He learned to roast turkeys and to drive a Pierce Arrow sedan, and he perfected the English he had begun to learn before he left Japan. In all, he spent five years with this family. Then his patron helped him enter the University of Idaho as an undergraduate, aiming toward a law degree. Papa used to joke that if he hadn't met Mama, he might have ended up a senator. She was too pretty, her brother Charlie once said. Ko couldn't leave her alone. She was the only Japanese girl in the whole Northwest worth looking at. I think there were two others around in those days, and they were both so skinny they could hide behind corn stalks. Mama's father came from a family of stonecutters around Niigata, on the inner coast of northern Japan. But she was born in Hawaii, where her father had come to do the backbreaking work Papa luckily avoided. A three-year labor contract on a sugarcane plantation, 10 hours a day, six days a week, for $12.50 a month. Completing that, he worked his way to the mainland and set out with his three sons to find a piece of land. They settled in the rich farm country around Spokane in Eastern Washington. In 1906, Mama and Granny joined them there. Granny was 30 then, Mama was 10. They sailed into San Francisco Bay on the morning after the earthquake and spent their first three days in America sitting offshore, watching the city go up in flames. Her family had high hopes for Mama. She was their only daughter. In those days, Japanese women on the mainland were rare, one for every seven or eight Japanese men. Most men had to go back to Japan to find a woman or take their chances on a picture bride. Mama was worth a lot. And before she finished high school, they had promised her to the upright son of a well-to-do farmer in the territory. She met Papa early one summer morning at a wholesale market where her family sold produce. Papa was unloading trucks and wagon loads of vegetables. She was 17, small, buxom, with a classically round face and a kind, much admired face of a kind much admired among Japanese. He was 25 a sometime law student who spent his summers working around Spokane. He liked to shoot pool in his spare time. He played cards and dressed like a man from a much flashier part of the country. He was also pitching for a semi-pro baseball team called Nippon. We have a picture of him down on one knee for the team photo in the front row, his mitted left hand resting on the other knee, his thick hair loose, his eyes showing a cocky confidence. His lean jaw bulges slightly as if holding a small plug of tobacco in the manner of Ty Cobb, whose style was the one to imitate about that time. Mama's parents were terrified when they saw him coming. He not only led what seemed to them to be a person, a perilously fast life, he also borrowed money. The story goes that he once asked Mama to borrow as much as she could from Granny. All Granny had at the time was a $5 bill. She gave it to Mama, who passed it on to Papa, who then came stalking into the kitchen, stiff-backed, glaring scornfully at Granny. He was insulted. It's not enough, he said. Five dollars? I need more than five dollars. If that's all you've got, I'd rather have nothing. And he threw the bill into the fire. The first time Mama ran away with him, her brothers came looking for her brought her back to the family farm and locked her in a second story room. Mama was so desolate, her oldest brother, Charlie, couldn't stand it. He leaned a ladder up to her window, forced the latch and let her out. That time they got away, got married and made it down to Salem, Oregon, where Papa cooked in a restaurant and she worked as a nurse and dietitian until my oldest brother was born in 1916. After that, she had a child about every two years nine in the next 18, and Papa kept moving, looking for the job, 
the piece of land, or the inspiration that would make him his fortune and give him the news he had hoped all his life where he would one day be able to send back to his relatives. Wakatsuki Ko made it big in America and has restored some honor to his family's name. Education mattered a great deal to him. In later years, he would brag to us that he went to law school and imply that he held some kind of degree from a Northern university. It's true that everywhere he stopped, he'd be helping a friend through one legal squabble or another, an immigration problem, a repossessed fishing boat. He worked for the government at one point, translating legal documents. But as badly as he wanted us to believe it, he never did finish law school. Who knows why? He was terribly proud, sometimes absurdly proud, and he refused to defer to any man. Maybe in training for that profession in those years before the First World War, he saw ahead of him prejudices he refused to swallow, humiliations he refused to bear. On the other hand, his schooling was almost like everything else he tried. For all his boasts and high intentions, he never quite finished anything he set out to do. Something always stopped him. Bad luck, a racial barrier, a law, his own vanity or arrogance or fear of losing face. For a couple of years, he tried lumberjacking in Seattle. We have another old photo, this one from the 20s, that shows him standing on a railroad siding with his boots spread wide, one hand in his jeans pocket and the other holding a wide brim hat flung high in boisterous greeting. A Nipponese frontiersman with the pine forests rising behind him. In Oregon, he learned a little dentistry, a skill he later put to good use at Manzanar, where he made dozens of dentures free of charge. He tried farming there too. The alien land laws prevented him from owning property, but he could lease the land or make a tenancy deal and work it. A few years before I was born, he had settled in the family on a 22 acre farm near Watsonville, California, raising apples, strawberries, and a few vegetable crops. He was making good money, living in a big Victorian house, and it looked as if he'd found his castle at last, but his luck didn't hold. The well went dry. 30 years after sailing away from a, financially from a financial dead end, the remnants of a once noble family in Japan, he found himself in the middle of America's depression and on the move again with eight kids and a wife this time, working his way down the California coast, picking prunes, peaches, Brussels sprouts, sending his children into the orchards like any migrant worker's family, hoping their combined earnings would leave a little left over after everyone was fed and the cars gassed up for the next day's search for work. Just before I was born, he leased another piece of land in Inglewood, outside Los Angeles, and farmed again briefly. Then, deciding land was too risky for investing either time or money, he turned to the ocean, started fishing out of Santa Monica, and did well enough at it through the late 30s that by December of 1941, he had those two boats, the Waka and the Nereid, a lease on the beach house in Ocean Park, and a nearly new Studebaker he had made a down payment on two weeks before Pearl Harbor was attacked. The start of World War II was not the climax to our life in Ocean Park. Pearl Harbor just snipped it off, stopped it from becoming whatever else lay ahead. Papa might have lost his business anyway, who knows? Sunk his boats, perhaps, the way Woody almost sank one off Santa Monica a few years later, when he motored into the largest school of mackerel he'd ever seen. Got so excited hauling in the fish, he let them pile up on deck and didn't notice water slipping through the gunwale slits and into the hold until the bow went under. If any single event climaxed those pre-war years, it was, for me at least, the silver wedding anniversary we celebrated in 1940. Papa was elegant that day in a brand new double-breasted worsted suit with a vest and silk tie and stick pin. He was still the dude, always the dude, no matter what, spending more money on his clothes than anything else. Mama wore a long crocheted rose-colored dress and I see them standing by our round dining room table this time heaped not with food, but with silver gifts, flatware, terrines, platters, trays, gravy bowls, and brandy snifters. The food was spread along a much larger table, buffet style, in glistening abundance. Chicken teriyaki, pickled vegetables, egg rolls, cucumber, and abalone salad. 
the seaweed wrapped rice bowls called sushi, shrimp, prawns, fresh lobster, and finally taking up what seemed like half the tablecloth, a great gleaming roast pig with a bright red apple in its mouth. A lot of in-laws were there and other Japanese families and Papa's fishing cronies, a big Portuguese named Goosey who used to eat sm small hot yellow peppers in one big bite just to make me laugh and an Italian named Blackie with long black sideburns and black hair slicked straight back, wearing black and white shoes and a black suit with white pinstripes. These two were his drinking buddies, as flush now as Papa was from the hot sake that was circulating and the beer and the whiskey. Papa announced that it was time to carve the pig. We all stood back to make a wide half circle around that end of the table. He had supervised the roasting, now he was going to show us how you cut up a pig. When he knew everyone was watching, we were his audience, this dining room, his theater. He lifted a huge butcher's cleaver. And while Goosey and Blackie, trying not to giggle, each held, held each side of a long cutting board beneath its neck, Papa chopped the head off in two swift crunching strokes. All the men cheered, the sons, the carousers. The women sucked in their breath and murmured. Three more stro strokes and Papa had the animal split. Two sides of roast pork steaming from within. With a serious face and a high held final flick, he split each side in half, quartering the pig. Then he set the cleaver down, stepped back, reached behind him without looking for a towel. One of my sisters somehow had there waiting as he wiped his hands and said imperiously to his sons, cut it up. You girls, bring the platters here. Everybody wants to eat. That's how I remember him before he disappeared. He was not a great man. He wasn't even a very successful man. He was a poser, a braggart, and a tyrant. But he had held, held on to his self-respect. He dreamed grand dreams. He could work well at any task he turned his hand to. He could raise vegetables, sail a boat, plead a case in small claims court, sing Japanese poems, make false teeth, and carve a pig. Whatever he did had flourish. Men who knew him at Fort Lincoln remember him well. They were all Issei, and he was one of the few fluent in Japanese and English. Each morning, the men would gather in their common room, and he would read the news aloud, making a performance of it by holding the American paper in front of him and translating into Japanese on the spot, orating the news altering his voice to suit the senator, the general, or the movie star. Papa worked as an interviewer there, helping the Justice Department interview other Issei's. He almost became an alcoholic there on rice wine the men learned to brew in the barracks. And somehow, during the winter of 42, both his feet were frostbitten. No one quite knows how. Papa never talked about that to anyone after he got back, but it isn't difficult to imagine. He arrived from Long Beach, California at the beginning of January in a country where cattle often freeze to death. And he was, of course, a prisoner of war.